Hi, this video explores a number of the aspects of the lost in tribes and what LDS scripture and prophets add to the Bible. This should go without saying, but I'm not trying to teach LDS doctrine here. It's just an exploration of ideas related to LDS doctrine and teachings in scripture. There's plenty of scriptural references to the lost ten tribes and unlimited YouTube videos on the subject. But even among the LDS community, with all our extra scriptures and revelations on it, opinions still differ, even among LDS leaders sometimes. My preference is to always start by taking scriptures literally. Unless a scripture or a prophet tells us that something is only symbolic or only a parable, I start off by assuming it's literal. And let me say up front that I believe there are scattered tribes of Israel dispersed among the nations. But I also believe that besides the scattered tribes, many of whom have forgotten their identities, there's a distinct group of the lost tribes who have gathered together, who have held on to their identities and their covenants, and who are hidden away by God to come forth as a group in the last day. Not every LDS member believes that idea, but I do, and so did Joseph Smith. So let's pull together what the various prophets have said on the matter and get more pieces of the puzzle together. As we know, Abraham's grandson Jacob sought to carry on his covenant with God and possess the covenant lands promised to him. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, and his twelve sons became the twelve tribes of Israel. Jacob had his twelve sons through two of his wives and two of his concubines. Just like Jacob received his birthright out of order, so did his son Joseph, and so did Joseph's son Ephraim. There's a strong pattern there, and I have some ideas about why that pattern might exist, but it might be a little too deep to do a YouTube video on it. I'll have to think about that. The double portion of the firstborn is not a reward. It's a responsibility, which is why really often the oldest son doesn't actually end up in that role. If someone is jealous of getting the double portion right there, there, that's an indication that they look at it like a personal possession rather than a responsibility. Jealousy just by itself is sort of a proof of unworthiness of the gift. So when the older brothers were tending sheep away from home and Joseph was sent to find them, some of his older brothers who were jealous of him threw him in a pit and planned to kill him. It was Judah, the fourth eldest son, who convinced the other brothers to sell Joseph to some traveling merchants rather than let him die. Judah saving Joseph's life begins a very interesting relationship between these two tribes, which I'll touch on later. Joseph ends up in Egypt and brings material abundance to Egypt and the region during a time of drought. He's the firstborn, a fruitful bow, and he saves Egypt, the surrounding region, and specifically saves his own family, including his murderous brothers, all from a physical famine. Before he died, Jacob blessed Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and in the process literally adopted them as his own sons, making the younger brother Ephraim the firstborn, the same pattern here, from the the house of Joseph. So now Ephraim and Manasseh are counted among the twelve tribes, Ephraim standing in Joseph's place, and Manasseh taking up Levi's place, because Levi was to be wholly focused on caring for the temple and the temple ordinances. In Genesis 49, Jacob reveals that Joseph would act out his role in the future in an area called the Everlasting Hills. So it's very clear that Joseph in the future would be the firstborn, but from a foreign land over the waters. Again, this prophecy came after he had already gone to Egypt and had already saved them physically. So this is obviously referring to a future revelation. As you likely know, many LDS consider the everlasting hills to be the Rocky Mountains, which span from Canada down through Arizona. And it's an area that also, that same area, has a very high concentration of Latter-day Saints. So the 12 sons all settle in Egypt and become 12 tribes. And by the time Moses comes around, there's millions of them. And during the 40-year exodus with Moses, God goes to incredibly great lengths to try to turn those 12 tribes into a covenant people. And the first leader of Israel to take them into the promised land was appropriately an Ephraimite named Joshua. And Joshua's first order of business was divvying up all the promised land among the 12 tribes. Notice on the map that when it comes to land, Ephraim certainly does not get a double portion. And you'll notice that Levi doesn't get land, but instead gets the responsibility for the temple. Both these kingdoms, the north and the south, struggled to get along and both routinely forgot their covenant. Even before bringing them into the promised land, God made it really clear that they were not to participate in pagan religions and rites. Strangely, he even had to specifically ban them from sacrificing their children in ritual sacrifice. Kind of strange that he had to do that. But then they not only forgot their God and their marriage covenant to him, but they were literally stepping out and worshiping pagan gods. This is why an adulterous nation and an idolatrous nation basically mean the same thing. But even worse, and much worse, they routinely would end up sacrificing their own kids in satanic ritual sacrifice. Moloch or Baal, which were connected in many ways, but the worship 
of those two was not a mild form of paganism. It was fully satanic. So their level of rebelliousness should help us understand why God's manner of speaking to his delinquent people was often quite harsh and kind of threatening. Obviously, God had gotten past the I'm going to count to three stage of trying to get their attention and was getting more serious. Let's not forget that their promised lands themselves were part of God's covenant, which they had rejected. So Isaiah and other prophets prophesied that they that if they didn't get their act together and return to God, they would be conquered and rejected from their promised land. But most of them don't repent. And as a result, God allows the northern kingdom of Israel to be conquered by the Assyrians. And the best and the brightest of the northern kingdom were taken prisoner and literally transplanted further north into Assyria. From that region, the ten tribes of Israel spread throughout the earth, populating different ethnic groups and nations wherever they went. For instance, the Pashtuns in Afghanistan and Pakistan consider themselves to be Hebrews. The largest tribe of the Pashtuns is the Yusufaze, which means descendants of Yusuf. That's Aramaic for Joseph, and it means God shall add in both Pashtu and in Aramaic. Many researchers believe the Scythians, who became very dominant in their region, were also part of the scattered tribes. Here's a map of one of the various theories about where the scattered tribes ended up. So for a little over 100 years, the kingdom of Judah is there alone until they too get captured and are taken into Babylon for about 70 years. But the Old Testament gives us plenty of revelation about what would happen to the scattered tribes. They are not lost to God, and he has not forgotten, which he makes clear in scripture after scripture. And God predicted early on who would oversee their eventual gathering. In Deuteronomy 33, he says, Let the blessings come upon the head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorn. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Joseph is associated with a young, strong bullock with horns of a unicorn. It's confusing here because you have an ox and unicorn used in the same sentence, but it's pretty well understood that unicorn is the word English translators use to describe the Arabian oryx. An Arabian oryx is not a horse, but actually a bovid, which is what a young bullock is too. It is a striking white animal and was often seen as a savior of the desert because if you're in trouble or lost in the desert and an oryx appeared, you're safe because they would eventually lead you to water. The 12 tribes each had banners with their symbol on it. And if either Ephraim or Manasseh had a side profile of an oryx on their banner, it would actually look like a unicorn. But we have the dual symbolism with the ancient baptismal font placed on the back of 12 oxen at the old Jerusalem temple. And the oxen are facing the four cardinal direction. This is repeated in LDS temple baptismal fonts and probably represent the idea of the house of Joseph carrying the burden of bringing the saving ordinances to the scattered tribes to the four corners of the earth. So we have Joseph as the unicorn that gathers the scattered tribes with his horns, but also the ox which provides the saving priesthood ordinance. Remember, Moses said, his horns are like the horns of a unicorn. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the tens of thousands of Ephraim. Joseph Smith Jr. was told that he was a literal blood descendant of Joseph and was actually his namesake. And as such, he was to carry out and fulfill the blessings given to Joseph by Jacob and then repeated by Moses. That means that according to Isaiah, Smith was to send tens of thousands of gatherers into the world to find the scattered, forgetful tribes. Isaiah made it clear to the Jews of his day that in the last days, something entirely new would come forth related to the gathering of Israel. He even told them they would not recognize it for what it was when it happened. Isaiah 43 Remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing, now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert. Isaiah is telling them to forget what they already know. The Hebrews didn't imagine a 14-year-old Ephraimite, named after Joseph of Egypt, living in a new world power, or kind of a new Egypt. They didn't recognize him bringing an abundance during a global spiritual famine, which we call the apostasy. They didn't recognize this new little religion springing up with thousands of followers for what it was, just like Isaiah predicted they wouldn't. And when the pioneers were toiling to make a new way through the wilderness to a new Zion, no one took notice that another of Isaiah's prophecies was being literally fulfilled with a new way in the wilderness. It wasn't too long before Joseph's new land was blessed with an even newer way through the wilderness, with the locomotive connecting one coast of the promised land 
to its other coast. And where was all of that completed? This new rail line? That's right in Joseph's Zion in the everlasting hills, commemorated with the golden spike. Almost within the hours of the pioneers entering their promised desert land, God's prophet Brigham directed the early saints to begin building a gigantic network of man-made rivers throughout the entire territory, bringing abundance to the driest region of the continent. The saints were also in Arizona. Here's my grandfather irrigating his farm from a canal. This area eventually became the city of Gilbert. Did you know that today, Utah has over 1,200 canal companies. That's a lot of new rivers in the desert. Another big, literal, miraculous win for Isaiah. Isaiah always seems so symbolic, and of course it is symbolic. But then the prophecy comes true, and we see that it was all extremely literal too. Yet Isaiah predicted that the Jews or the world would not recognize it for what it was, even though it's so literal. Jeremiah had a similar message. The Israelites based so much of their faith on the stories of the Exodus. But he prophesied that a new work would come forth big enough to replace the miracles of the Exodus. It would be a new marvelous work and wonder, so to speak. In Jeremiah 16, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, The Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Jeremiah predicted that once this work is finally recognized for what it is, it will be appreciated for its tremendous importance to Israel. Joseph Smith prophesied that there would be a literal gathering of Israel, not only a spiritual gathering. One part of that literal gathering could be the Ephraimite Gentiles literally coming to their new promised land, North America, and becoming a fruitful bough there, just like Lehi and his family did earlier. Genealogists often associate the United Kingdom with Ephraimites, and of course the UK founded the North American colony, and also large parts of Canada. Did you know that in 1851, there were twice as many Latter-day Saints in Britain as there were in the United States, twice as many in Britain as in the U.S.? Another apparent aspect of the literal gathering occurred about 100 years after Joseph made that statement, and the nation of Israel was literally established again in Palestine, and the Jews were literally gathered back to their homeland. It was principally the United States and England, ostensibly the Ephraimites, who freed Judah from the atrocities of World War II, established the nation of Israel and facilitated the return of the tribe of Judah back to their homeland. It's another example of the special relationship between the house of Judah and the house of Joseph. British genealogists, as I've mentioned, associate the Anglo-Saxons with Ephraim. The royal coat of arms for England is considered to represent both houses of Ephraim and Judah. The unicorn and the lion represent each house. The right of the firstborn blessings come with Ephraim, and the right to wear the crown comes with Judah. Very old tradition holds that the priesthood has the power to designate and crown the king. This is why Henry VIII had to create his own religion because the so-called priesthood in Rome refused to ordain his kingship. We know that the actual priesthood ordinances lie with Ephraim, the firstborn. I'm focusing a lot on Joseph and Ephraim because they have had a specific role in initiating the grand work of the actual gathering of the scattered tribe and fulfilling of many of the scriptures that look forward to this day and to this work. Think about it. Before Joseph Joseph Smith, none of these scriptures were fulfilled. But since the day that Joseph Smith prophesied about the literal gathering of Israel, the horn of the unicorns have been very, very busy and very successful in ushering God's people back into a relationship with the Father through covenants, and in some cases back to their covenant lands. Smith's article of faith supports the promise God made through Moses that there would be tens of thousands of Ephraimites guiding the scattered tribes back to God with their horn. That article of faith also correlates to revelation of Jeremiah, who saw God gathering the scattered tribes in the last days, saying, Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. This seems to describe LDS missionaries going throughout the world. Today, every tribe is represented in this missionary force, but it was largely the Ephraimites in the U.S., Canada, and England 
who initiated the gathering of these gatherers or fishers. In the Deseret News, it states that by the end of 2023, we expect to have 72,000 missionaries afield. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just interesting that if you double 72,000, you get exactly 144,000. Why is that useful? Well, it's useful to think about scale. If you think about how many missionaries you personally know who are serving missions right now, you can just double that number and it will give you a sense of how many of the 144,000 hunters will be out in the world during the tribulations. They'll be out there in a troubled world gathering the elect with the fullness of the priesthood power. I plan to do a video on just what the fullness of priesthood power really means, so stay tuned for that. And he says, And after the fishers, he then will send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain mountain, from every hill, and out of the holes of the rock. So unlike today's missionaries who spread their nets wide and will eventually be called home when things get too turbulent, the 144,000 will know specifically who they are assigned to save, and they will go out with power without fear. They know who they're going to minister to and who they're supposed to gather. They are the hunters who can find the elect wherever they are, but they will also have power over the wicked of the world, and when necessary, also find them wherever they hide. The prophets Isaiah and later Jeremiah prophesied at length about the gathering of the lost tribes of Israel and their return from the north. Isaiah described Zion being established in the everlasting hills as a headquarters for Joseph to fulfill his work as the gatherer. In both the Old and New Testaments, Jerusalem and Zion are described as separate things. Zion's a broad term, but it's clear that Jerusalem and Zion are separate but both have a role among God's chosen people. In Isaiah 4, it says, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Isaiah is indicating that sometime in the future, Zion and Jerusalem will only be inhabited by truly holy individuals. I believe that refers to those who are left, meaning those in both regions who remain strong through the tribulations and remained in the covenant. From an LDS perspective, we see this as the New Jerusalem or Mount Zion and Jerusalem. These cities being filled with people who have made it through the trials of the tribulations have been refined and are therefore holy. And so Jerusalem will be renewed, obviously, by that time and will be a city of God after Christ appears there on the Mount of Olives. The LDS were not deemed worthy enough to build the New Jerusalem immediately. And so they're instructed to build a preparatory lesser Zion in the everlasting hills. It's far from holy, but it is the current headquarters of the work of the many fishers and the busy unicorns. Check out my video on my channel called The Dead Sea Scrolls Foresaw Salt Lake City to see more on that topic. It's a pretty interesting connection I make there in that video, and you might be interested in it. I'll put a link in the description, or you can just go to my channel. Anyway, Isaiah went on at length and in great detail and seems to be talking about the latter-day work at Mount Zion in a more general sense. He refers to the long apostasy that existed before the restoration of the fullness of the gospel. In 20, Isaiah 29, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes the prophets and your rulers the seers has he covered so there's the apostasy and in the next verses Isaiah gets very literal and specific as he describes the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, which would signal the end of that apostasy and the beginning of the awakening of the scattered tribes to their relationship and their covenant with God. Verses 11, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor, but have removed their hearts far from, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. So he's discussing there that the Book of Mormon would come forth, which is the foundation for the work of the gathering. Then Isaiah describes the beginning of the great last day's gathering, which would begin, and how the knowledge of the gospel would come forward in its simplicity to replace all the philosophies of men that corrupted it during the apostasy. Verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudence shall be hid. Remember when Jeremiah was telling the Jews that 
something brand new would happen that would even replace the wonderment surrounding the Exodus and the miracles there. The prophet Joel foresaw that during the tribulation near the beginning of the millennium, Mount Zion and the older restored Jerusalem will be the two headquarters for deliverance to those who call on the name of the Lord. Joel 2. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Isaiah 31. And he shall pass over his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign, saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace Jerusalem. Here we see that the relationship between Joseph and Judah plays an even more important role in the last days. When Ephraim and Manasseh set up the new Jerusalem as a major stake of Zion on earth, then Christ will come to Judah on the Mount of Olives and establish the renewed Jerusalem as the second great stake of Zion on earth. Ephraim and Judah will both have headquarters from which the millennium will be ushered in and administered. Isaiah makes it clear that Christ will reign in both Mount Zion and Jerusalem. Before Joseph Smith, neither the Mount of Zion nor Jerusalem were in place to meet those definitions. The ten tribes were still lost to their identity and their promised lands, and Jerusalem was also abandoned by the Jews, who never recovered from the Roman conquest following their crucifixion of their own Messiah. But, since Joseph Smith in his calling to open this work, Judah has returned to Jerusalem, and Jews are beginning to recognize Christ for their Messiah. Mount Zion has begun the process of being established in Joseph's new promised land, and the work of gathering the scattered tribes and their learning of their identities is very well underway and quite mature. The early converts to the restored gospel found their way to the new promised land of North America and helped establish Mount Zion here. I'm speaking as an American. In Jeremiah 50, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Micah 4. But in the last days it shall come to pass that The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. If it was Joseph Smith's job to get the great gathering started, It makes sense that he would have received revelation about this work and how it all fits into the last days. So let's go over some of those. In Doctrine and Covenants 110, 11, After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared to us and committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. God's making it very clear there, the distinction between the gathering of the scattered tribes and the leading of the tribes from the north. Leading and gathering are two different words. And we know that Joseph, along with the Melchizedek priesthood, was given the keys for gathering both the scattered tribes. In DNC 131, Heavenly Father tells Joseph Smith in full detail about the great gathering and how it would play out. Yea, verily I say unto you again, the time has come when the voice of the Lord is unto you. Go ye out of Babylon, gather ye out from among the nations, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. We know that the early saints did this exactly. They began to leave the world from wherever they were, to leave it behind and gather into pockets of Zion, such as in Kirtland, in Far West, Nauvoo, and eventually in Salt Lake City. The early saints sold their farms, gave up their past lives, and faced tremendous opposition from the world for their trouble. In the face of all these hardships, the men left their wives and children behind, and sometimes with no resources, went out into the world to announce that the gathering had begun, carrying with them a few copies of Isaiah's sealed book in their bag. So who responded to these poor, unskilled preachers? Very likely, many of those who responded first were those who carried the actual blood of Joseph in their vein or of the other tribes. The early gatherers were being called to to gather first their own, their own being the tribe of Joseph and then the other scattered tribes. Where were the scattered tribes to be found? Well, among the Gentiles. That's why they were sent to the Gentiles first, first the scattered tribes, 
And once Mount Zion began to be established in North America and in the stakes of Zion throughout the world, then the work was be taken to Jews. Remember in verse 8 it says, and then upon the Jews. In verse 9, behold, lo, this shall be their cry, and the voice of the Lord unto all nations. Go ye forth unto the land of Zion, that the borders of my people may be enlarged, and that her stakes may be strengthened, and that Zion may go forth unto the regions round about. The first wave of respondents were largely from U.S., Canada, and the United. They responded sometimes in groups of thousands, and in most cases they made their way to Mount Zion, being established in North America. Remember, at one point there were twice as many members in Britain as there were in the U.S. Verse 11, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour. Let them therefore who are among the Gentiles flee to Zion, and let them who be of Judah flee unto Jerusalem, unto the mountains of the Lord's house. And so the work began with an eye toward preparing a foothold on earth for Christ's second coming. Neither the day nor hour mattered. What mattered was that it was the season. The field was white and ready to harvest. For those who fully leave Babylon behind, even in the face of tribulation, they will stand on Mount Zion and will be there when Christ appears to organize the finishing work. Verse 18, When the Lamb shall stand upon Mount Zion, and with them 144,000, having his Father name written on their forehead, wherefore prepare ye for the coming of the bride, go ye, go ye, out to meet him. Christ will not only work from New Jerusalem, he will appear, as we've said, in other areas as he deems necessary, including on the Mount of Olives to save Jerusalem in their time of despair and to reclaim Jerusalem as a city of holiness, another base of operations we've talked about. In verse 20, For behold, he shall stand upon the Mount Olivet, and upon the mighty ocean, even the great deep, and upon the islands of the sea, and upon the land of Zion. See how there's separate things there. He will guide his work from the new Jerusalem and the renewed Jerusalem, and that work will be about reaching all the elect, ministering to them, healing them, and gathering them to holy cities of light. The world's people will hear his message, and those who wish to respond will be found and gathered. The way I see it is that the holy will be within these cities, ministering to those who come to the city, and the 144 thousand will be the ones that go out into a turbulent world to find and gather those who need healing. In verse 21, he shall utter his voice out of Zion, and he shall speak from Jerusalem, and his voice shall be heard among all people. At some point, Christ will bring the continents back together, and the continents of the new Jerusalem and the renewed Jerusalem will be unified once again as they were before the flood. In 23, he shall command the great deep, and it shall be driven back into the north countries, and the islands shall become one land, and the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back into their own place, and the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. And the Lord, even the Savior, shall stand in the midst of his people and shall reign over all flesh. So toward the fulfillment of all these things, the hidden remnant will be called forth from the north. They will have been hidden by rocks and ice, but those barriers will be removed. A way will be prepared for them, and they will all come with power to the new Jerusalem. There will still be tribulations on the earth, for we're told that as they travel, their enemies will become subject to them, and the earth will bring abundance to them once they come. Verse 26, And they who are in the north country shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves, and they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall flow down at their presence, and a highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. Their enemies shall become prayed unto them, and in the barren deserts there shall come forth pools of living water, and the parched ground shall no longer be thirsty land. I don't know exactly what this highway is, but the early Israelites did not understand what a railway would have been as a new way through the wilderness. So I'm just open-minded that Heavenly Father has a plan to get them here easily. Anyway, they'll come to the new Jerusalem, established by the firstborn Ephraim, the fruitful bough, and they'll bring with them their spiritual gifts, their sacred histories, and their sacred revelations. Those will be treasures. It'll be a great final reunion after the scattering, and the earth itself will celebrate. Verse 30, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servant, and the boundaries of the everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. So there they'll receive the full blessings of the fullness of the gospel, which they have looked forward to ever since Moses broke the stone tablets that contained the blessings of the Melchizedek priesthood. We know it was on those stone tablets because of the Joseph Smith translation in Exodus. Let me read that. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tablets of stone like unto the first, 
and I will write upon them also the words of the law according as they were written at the first on the tables which thou breakest. But it shall not be according to the first, for I will take away the priesthood out of their midst. Therefore my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them. So in other words, the difference between the first tablets which were broken and the second is the first ones contained the holy Melchizedek priesthood ordinances or the temple ordinances. The hidden remnant will be coming to Ephraim who holds the keys to those higher priesthood ordinances, the higher temple ordinances that they've been waiting for since Moses broke those first stone tablets. So why do they want those ordinances? Because they know they are necessary so he can introduce them into the Father's presence. There shall they fall down and be crowned with glory even in Zion by the hands of the servants of the Lord and the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel and the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. They shall also of the tribe of Judah after their pain shall be sanctified in holiness before the Lord to dwell in his presence day and night. Already though today the tribe of Judah is beginning to discover the true identity of their Messiah. If you're not aware of it already, I strongly recommend you go check out a YouTube channel called One for Israel. It's an amazing Jewish resource for Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews are those who have discovered that Christ was in fact their Messiah. So they're not really Christians because they're Jews, but they believe in Christ. So they kind of a mix of Christians and Jews. I recommend you go and watch and listen to these who know better than the rest of us just how Jewish it is to come unto Christ. And the fact that Jews are beginning to find Christ is likely a signal that much of the gathering among the scattered tribes has been done and that we are getting closer and closer to the final seven years of the last days that we call the tribulations when a lot of these things occur. Ezra, who is also known as Ezra, was the principal prophet among the Jews as they were returning to Jerusalem from their exile in Babylon, they are beginning to build the temple. The Catholic Church cut some of his books out of the Bible, but I don't recognize their authority to do that. So we're going to take a look at some of his censored writings. He writes in the Old Testament, but here he's referring to Christ's second coming in 4.13, before Esdras chapter 13. And the time shall be when these things shall come to pass, and then shall my son be declared, whom thou sawest as a man ascending. And when all the people hear his voice, every man shall shall in their own land leave the battle they have one against another, and an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as thou sawest them, willing to come and to overcome him by fighting. So they'll come after him once they think he's coming. But he shall stand upon the top of Mount Zion, and Zion shall come, and shall be showed to all men, being prepared and builded, like as thou sawest the hill graven without hand. This is not Christ appearing on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It's him appearing at the temple in the New Jerusalem, in the latter day Zion during a time when the tribulation still rage on earth. And it goes forward, And this my son shall rebuke wicked inventions of those nations, which for their wicked life are fallen into the temple, and shall lay before them their evil thoughts and torments, wherewith they shall begin to be tormented, which are like unto a flame, and he shall destroy them without labor by the law. So Christ will rebuke and expose the wicked inventions or the secret combinations, and that probably includes war weapons and, and technology they use to harm the world and, and its people. So for more on the secret combinations, I have a video on that. It's called A Warning for America from the Book of Mormon, and it covers the secret combinations in pretty good depth. I'll stick that link below too. Now listen carefully to the next part. He's talking about the lost tribes here, but he's specifically referring to a group that stays together and travels a long way across the water. And whereas thou sawest that he gathered another peaceable multitude unto him, those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land, and he carried them over the water, and so came they unto another land. But they took his counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt, that they might there keep their statutes, which they never kept in their own land. Very interesting. Ezra's telling us that the sun would gather a peaceable multitude and then carry them over the waters into another land. This multitude decided to go forth into a further country where never mankind had dwelt. 
They went there in order to keep in remembrance who they were to keep the law of Moses, which they had failed to do for their captivity. In other words, the specific sector of the lost tribes repented, kept traveling until they could find their own Zion faithfully, and according to Ezra, they were led there by God. We see the same pattern with the Jaredites, the Mulekites, the Nephites, and others who need to leave Babylon behind, find an, their own place where they could live according to a higher law. Apparently, they're still there today, still keeping their covenant, and likely awaiting their reunion with the Ephraimites, who can give them the higher law. Ezra goes on, For through that country there was a great way to go, namely of a year and a half, and the same region is called Asareth, and that just means land farther away. Then dwelt they there until the latter time, and now when they shall begin to come. The highest shall stay the springs of the stream again, that they may go through. Therefore sawest thou the multitude with peace. So where is this remnant of repentant members of the lost ten tribes? Where are they hidden until it's time for them to come forth in power during the tribulations. In the fifth chapter of Ezra, fourth Ezra, the prophet seems to be likening the ten tribes and where they are to children that are waiting to be reborn out of the earth. And he said unto me, Ask the womb of a woman, and say unto her, If thou bringest forth children, why dost thou now take not together, but after one another? Pray her therefore to bring forth her children at once. And I said, She cannot, but must do it by distance of time. Then said he unto me, Even so have I given the womb of the earth to those that be sown in it. I've seen a lot of LDS YouTubers arguing over whether there's actually a hidden remnant or if it's just all symbolic of the spiritual gathering of the lost tribes. But thankfully Joseph Smith would sometimes directly answer questions like that to saints who he trusted. If Enoch, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezra, and so many other prophets received revelation about the great Latter-day Gathering, what level of detail do you think Joseph Smith received on that topic, considering it's literally his dispensation? and he holds the keys to all that last day's work. I'm always flabbergasted when LDS scholars or academics throw what Joseph Smith says about a given topic into the mix as though it has equal value to anyone else's opinion, sometimes including even their own. A good example of that is some in the BYU academic community and their addiction to their notion that the events of the Book of Mormon occurred somewhere other than the heart of North America, which the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith were very clear about. I touch a little of that on my video, The Hope well and the circling of the square. If you're interested in that kind of topic, check that one out. Anyway, Joseph wasn't perfect, but if there's one source I'm trusting on the last days, it'll be the head of that very dispensation. When Joseph speaks, whether from the pulpit or to a trusted friend, I listen. Maybe that's just me, but I really like to hear what the people say who knew him best. Anyway, I like to refer to the writings of Benjamin Franklin Johnson because he's my great, great, great grandfather, and I've studied his detailed memoirs pretty carefully. Along with William Clayton Benjamin was a personal assistant to Joseph Smith. Joseph called him Benny. He often ate dinner with the Smiths and was a truly intimate family friend. Brigham Young even asked Benjamin Johnson to make a final pitch to Emma Smith to come with the Saints out to Utah because Young knew that B.F. Johnson was more intimate and more trusted among the Smith family than even he himself was at that time. Anyway, one night at dinner, B.F. Johnson asked Joseph Smith directly where the lost remnant in the North actually was and he Here's his account. Quote, I asked where the nine and a half tribes of Israel were. Well, said he, you remember the old cauldron or potash kettle you used to boil maple sap in for sugar, don't you? I said, yes. Well, said he, they are in the North Pole in a concave just the shape of that kettle, and John the Revelator is with them, preparing them for their return. So B.F. Johnson's extensive, detailed memoirs, which includes that quotation, they're highly respected by church historians. He was not not fanciful, and his accounts were warts and all straightforward records of what he experienced to Joseph, as Joseph Smith's personal assistant. If B.F. Johnson claimed that Joseph Smith made that above statement, it is very likely that he did. Neither Benny nor Joseph were known to exaggerate or talk fancifully about gospel topics. And notice that Joseph said that John the Revelator was with them. That's cool. We know he was translated, so the fact that John the Revelator dwells with the lost tribes may imply that they live a pretty advanced and informed existence. Though they don't have the higher temple ordinances, it's still possible that they even live some version of the law of consecration and even maybe a higher level of existence than we hear out here in the world. It's not clear whether Joseph was referring to an open indentation in the ground or whether 
the hidden remnant was in a large cave of some sort. Living below Earth's surface may just be a way to describe the fact that they are hidden in a higher vibration or dimension here on Earth, but sequestered from mortal view, kind of like the spirit world is. Or they may just live in areas below the surface, just like he described. It could be a version of both, too. Anyway, all the scriptures about them being in Mother Earth's womb makes me believe that they are protected under the Earth somehow. I don't really need to know how that would work, because God can arrange anything he wants to arrange. I'll leave it up to that. But all the scriptures and references I've already covered lead me to wonder if the following scriptures and quotations don't confirm what Joseph Smith and Ezra described. In Philippians 2, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name, and which, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the glory of God the Father. It's interesting that it says things in the earth, but then things under the earth are specified as a separate thing that would recognize Christ. In Moses 6, And behold, all things have their likeness, and all things are created and made to bear record of me, both things which are temporal and things which are spiritual, things which are in the heavens above, and things which are on the earth, and things which are in the earth, and things which are under the earth both above and beneath, all things bear record. Isn't that interesting that he talks about things are in the earth, but also under in Doctrine and Covenants 88. Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you, that you may be instructed more perfectly in theory and principle and doctrine and the law of the gospel. And here, remember, this is about learning spiritual things. And in all things that pertain unto the kingdom of God that are expedient for you, for you to understand. And then he gets specific about the things that we are to understand. In verse 79, of things both in the earth in heaven and in the earth and under the earth. things which have been things which are things which must shortly come to pass things which are at home and abroad the wars perplexities of perplexities of nations etc etc that ye may be prepared in all things when i shall send you again to magnify the calling whereunto i have called you the mission which i have commissioned remember joseph smith was commissioned to bring forth the hidden tribes from that northern territory and here he has to understand things that are under the earth they were connected that commission and that knowledge are connected there. In DNC 104, and this shall be the sound of his trump, saying to all people, now again, this is about all people, both in heaven and in earth, and that are under the earth, for every ear shall hear it, every knee shall bow. Interesting that there's clearly here, and this is Doctrine and Covenant, perfectly translated into English through Revelation, talking about all people that are in heaven, in earth, and Isaiah 45, drop down ye heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation. As modern saints, we have the benefit of knowing that Isaiah is extremely literal. Doesn't this sound like a very literal depiction of the hidden remnant coming out of the ground, out of the earth in the last days, providing protection against the wicked? Here's a chapter by Job where it sounds like he's referring to the hidden remnant going to the ends of the earth, protected and treasured in the snow, and reserved for the tribulations to come forth, fight with power against the wicked arm. Same thing here. Job 8, that thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof, and that thou shouldest know Know the path to the house thereof. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day? And then Brigham Young says, Your name shall be blotted out in the book of life from the heavens, from the earth, and from under the earth. In other words, God's laws cover everything, whether it's above earth or under. Again, from Brigham Young, if thou wilt follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles, as recorded in the New Testament, every man and woman will be put in possession of the Holy Ghost. Every person will become prophet, seer, and revelator, and an expounder of truth. That means all of us here. It's not just Joseph Smith or prophet. They will know things that are, that will be, and that have been. So we get to know things that other people don't know. He says it again 13 years later. He brings up the same thing. The Spirit enables them to grow in grace and in the knowledge of truth, as the Savior did, until, in other words, we continue to gain knowledge, until they understand men and things, the world and its stock, whether Christian, heathen, or pagan, and will ultimately lead them to a knowledge of things in heaven, on earth. We have embraced all truth in heavens, on earth, under the earth, on other planets, and in every kingdom there is in all eternity. Every truth in every kingdom that exists embraced in our faith. Brigham Young repeats that with the spirit we can learn about things under the earth. But this time even makes references to other planets, which should be a uniquely LDS friendly topic. But the LDS people are afraid to talk about it. Maybe I'll do a video on that 
that subject sometime. I've been thinking about it for about 20 years, and maybe it's time to collect my thoughts on it. Anyway, John Taylor also speaks about this. He is going to build up his kingdom, and all kingdoms, powers, dominions will be brought into subjection to the name of our God, and every creature which is in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and such as are in the sea. Same type of reference there. Elder Orson Pratt, I do not wish to make my statement only in regard to this, but the revelations of God inform us. That there have been men who have had their eyes quickened by this other species of light so that they could see things under the earth as well as things on its surface. In other words, you have, you can see spiritually, you can see what's under. God will continue to direct its affairs and there is no power on earth or under the earth that can ever stop its progress. Um, Orson Pratt goes on in the Journal of Discourses kind of in detail and I want to just read a little bit of what he said. Away in yonder north countries where I do not know, but away in those regions are ten tribes of the house of Israel. Where will they go to? Will they go immediately to Palestine, where they formerly had their inheritance? No. Jeremiah tells us where they will go. He tells us there is to be a place called Zion before these tribes come out of the north countries, and when they come with a great company. How long will they who come from the north countries tarry in the heights of Zion? Sometime they will dwell in Zion a good while, and during that time there will be 12,000 chosen out of each of those 12, 10 tribes. Besides 12,000, they will be chosen from Judah, Joseph, and the remaining tribes. 144,000 in all. In other words, he's implying that they will first come to receive their ordinances and blessings and connect Ephraimites, and then a number of them will probably return to their promised land, Palestine. So that's a description given to us by one of Joseph's original 12 apostles. When I know, like I've said before, that an early saint had an intimate relationship with Joseph, I tend to read what they say with a lot of interest. So as usual, this is all very speculative. I'm not teaching doctrine. I'm exploring questions that the scriptures and prophets ask. I consider it a fun, healthy practice, and my own opinions constantly shift the more I learn and the more I think about them. I think we should all be free to do that. But still, the evidence is quite obvious that there is a group up north that is hidden from us and that is taught by John the Revelator and probably others. When we're struggling to build the new Jerusalem in the face of extreme wickedness, I believe this hidden remnant will come out of the earth to support us and to share their knowledge with us. We will share our scriptures and the higher we stood with them. That's a really exciting thought for me, and I hope I can witness either from the Spirit world or as a righteous participant here on earth. Anyway, thanks for watching this whole video. I'm aware that my videos get long, but my goal and my hope is to pull in enough information to make us smarter by solidifying some ideas we already know and especially to opening up doors to new ideas. That's the goal. If you got something out of the video, go ahead and give it a like and that'll help more people see it. My next video is going to be about the relationship among Abraham, Seth, and Melchizedek. And there's a lot of information about Seth and Melchizedek that's speculative, interesting. I've got a really interesting interesting new idea on the topic that I want to share. And so if you're interested in that, just subscribe and you'll get notified when that comes out. And again, thanks for listening.